Hello. Thank you all for coming. It's a really great turnout. Very exciting. I am actually really, really excited. We just had some amazing news at literally four o'clock this afternoon. I'm going to make you wait for that then. <laughs> Okay, so hello, I'm Louisa Davison, part of the steering group for Systems of Climate Lobby UK. Welcome to How Long Does Our Livable Climate Have? A subject which has come sharply into focus after the, inter the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report released two weeks ago. According to that report, we have just 12 years to clean up our act, but only if we, we become radical in our approach to combating greenhouse gas emissions. After Eric Gilbert and Professor Dave Waltham had given their talks, I will say a little bit about Citizens Climate Lobby and our solution to slash those emissions, carbon fee and dividend, and the brilliant news. After that will be time for questions. So on to our first talk. First up is Eric Gilbert our amateur weatherman in Marlborough, Wiltshire. Eric has been diligently keeping daily weather records since 1984. As you can imagine, he has a wealth of local data on how the weather has changed over the last three and a half decades. In Britain, with regards to climate change, we are the proverbial boiled frog. With our temperate climate, the effects are gradual and may not be extreme until it's too late. But here is Eric with local robust figures that support our need for speed to tackle climate change. And Eric will be interviewed by Gina Cook of the Citizens Climate Lobby Steering Committee. Okay, now Eric, I know you're going to begin by telling us a bit about how you get started and what sort of measurements you take. My interest in recording the weather started as a teenager 10 miles down the road and it consisted of just one maximum minimum thermometer you might have in the greenhouse tucked under the bird table to keep it away from the sunshine uh, and a simple wall barometer that I did for two or three years but having got married and moved to Marlborough I didn't do anything more for quite a long time but by 1984 when I uh, had my own headship in Swindon, I decided moving from Marlborough was not likely, so it was worth investing time and money in starting a, a proper weather station with accurate date details. The first weather station started with a, a, a Stevenson screen. Uh, you probably all know these are white boxes with louvers all around to let the air flow uh, and being white to reflect solar energy. And just a simple thermometer inside, an anemometer, and uh, a rain gauge. Uh, that I did for quite a number of years. Uh, later on the uh, wired meteorological systems came on but they are limited on the length of wire so it did uh, dictate the position I could put it but it did give me far more information and back in uh, 2009 electronics moving on I then installed uh, a wireless station which allowed me to put it in a much better place. The first uh, station, as I say, was limited by the length of wire, so it was a bit closer to the, the building, it was hedged near, but I've kept that system of data, recording data from the very beginning because it's important to get a, uh, the data over a long period of time. And the latest weather station was installed in 2009 as a wireless one. Now this allowed me to get away from the buildings way up the garden, more or less a flat area, away, as far away from the trees as I can in Marlborough and far away from, from buildings. This new system uh, records temperature, rainfall, wind speed, direction, solar radiation, ultraviolet light, barometric pressure, and it computes a number of other details such as evaporation and wind chill. Now these see the screens uh, the first one slowly rotted away, the replacement, they're not, not cheap, they're nearly 600 pounds to replace the screen itself before you put the instruments aside. And the latest uh, weather station is into four figures. 
because we want some accurate data that is reliable over a period of time. The rainfall gauge, which sits on top of the weather station, is an automatic one. And as it rains, it takes and sends a, a pulse to the computer at every point two of a millimeter. But I use the standard Met Office five inch rain gauge, uh, which is more accurate at point one of a millimeter rather than the automatic at point two. And these are recommended to be a certain height above the ground, 30 centimeters. And the Stevenson screen uh, should be between one, one, two and two meters above the ground. Uh, some 10, 12 years ago, I was invited to join the Climatological Observers Link, which is a national organization, and I submit my data every month to them, and they're linked with the Met Office. So it's, it, it's, it, I find it useful that somebody else can uh, find a purpose for, for this uh, information. Uh, recently, I did a sunshine recorder and a right angle thermometer, which is a soil thermometer, and this is five centimeters in the ground. So gradually extended the information I keep. I mentioned the wireless went up the garden because the Met Office say level ground, no frost hollows, away from buildings and trees. And so the climatological observers link grade the stations from which they receive all this information. I was asked a question about the Met Office. Uh, as far as I can find it, they've got something like 25 manned weather stations, uh, two or three, I think, specifically near the coast for wind speed and wind strength, and more than 200 automatic stations, uh, plus, of course, satellites and weather boys and weather ships. I was also going to mention that my information goes to the Climatical Observers link, linked to the Met Office. But of course, these days, we can get the Met Office data on our televisions and radio. But the BBC, you probably realise, 12 months ago, are now using the Meteo Group. And I've made one or two interesting comparisons <coughs> over five-day periods, because I'd like to know which is more accurate. <coughs> and on the three occasions, I've done a five-day cross-check between the two. For Marlborough, I found the Meteo Group was more accurate. But I also notice they've now update their uh, information uh, more than once a day. Now, <clears throat> the reason for asking me was to find some local information. If we can then move on to uh, the temperature, please. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, January, mean month, the mean months to start with. And you can see the top graph of the actual mean temperatures and below the mean temperatures since 1984. It's always risky to, to, to make some sort of assumption from the whole graph. I think it takes perhaps 10 or 12 years uh, to get an indication of what is happening. <clears throat> because you can get a, a cold January or a hot January and it takes a few years for it to settle down to get a true average. Uh, January is more or less settled down now. Can we look at um, April, please? Sure. <coughs> now that looks rather different. There's a, a definite upward trend in the April temperatures. Even allowing the first, say, eight or ten years, it is increasing more or less every year with slight uh, variations, which perhaps get a hot or a cold one. Uh, could we try May, please? And a similar sort of graph for May. Can we then jump down to December? <coughs> and that is quite different. We've had some uh, colder Decembers. Uh, it isn't showing an, a general upward trend. <coughs> Can we jump to the seasons, please? If we look at some of the seasons when we're putting obviously three months together and have a look at, can we try spring? <clears throat> that is quite a, a distinctive upward trend. Um, but for the records I send in the Met Office, spring is three complete months of March, April and May. It just helps statistically to do all the calculations. Uh, if 
briefly at summer, please? Again, at, uh, if you take from here upwards, it is a more or less upward trend, beginning to level out now, and winter. <clears throat> and that is uh, quite a variation. And lastly, the year, to get an overall picture of the year, please. <clears throat> when you look at the year as a whole, that is quite a distinctive upward trend. I was interested, uh, that's often I think, I wonder what if, and I do some analysis. And so I looked at uh, air frosts. Could we have the air frost, please? Uh, the spring one first. And I took the first of June as a datum and calculated the number of days for the last air frost. And it's moving backwards in the year. These are the number of days before the first of June. And the last air frost is getting earlier and earlier in the year, as you would expect as the temperatures rise. Can we look at the um, September one, please? And then the other side of the year for autumn air frosts. So what? Autumn? September, autumn September. air frost should be next. Oh. That one. And that Sorry, same, same, <laughs> same trend again. That the, as a general trend, the first air frost is getting later in the year. And the air frost we calculate is a minus 0.1 and below. And when we looked at uh, temperatures, can we look at rain, please? So that's another feature. Spring rain, please. <coughs> it obviously varies considerably from year to year, but in the spring, there is an uh, indication of an upward trend if you ignore the beginning of, of the, uh, the, the recording there. Can we look at summer, please? Um, it did level out in the uh, late 1990s and 200s, but uh, has been increasing the last eight or 10 years. And finally, the year on the rain, please. Of course, as we see the air warming, Warmer air holds more moisture, so it's not surprising that the rainfall is increasing. Mm -hmm. And this is putting all together for each year. So there's a definite, with the ups and downs, but there's a general upward trend there. I then thought, I wonder if there's a greater incidence of heavy rainfall, not just general rainfall for the month of the year. Can we pick up uh, uh, 15 to 20 millimeters? Can you find that one, please? This is what I call fairly moderate rain, between 15 and 20 millimetres uh, in a 24 hour period. And there is an indication that these days with heavier rain, which once again with warmer atmosphere, holding more moisture, you would expect. And finally, the 25 millimetres. So once again, there is a, a general increase in that. Uh, now, somebody asked me the other day, have you ever analysed <coughs> The wind strength, we think it's not quite as windy as it used to be. Can we find the wind, please? And the average speed in January is slightly decreasing. And when I went through the 12 months of the year, <coughs> each month over that period from 2001, I moved the anemometer to a slightly better position. It's uh, something like four meters above the ridge of our building, so it's quite high in the air. Each month in the year showed a decrease over what? 10, 17, 18 years, or something like one miles per hour. Can you pick up the wind ones which has got um, 40 miles an hour? These are the gusts. Can you find that? There we are. And these are occasions when they, we hit 40 miles an hour or more. And once again, it, it shows that the evidence that we're having more of these really windy days. Finally, I thought might be of interest. Can you move to the diurnal ones? <clears throat> Once again, this is a, a data I sent my, by my group to the Met Office. Diurno is a variation between day and night. Uh, this is December, and the minimum variation is fairly static. But you can see there's an increase uh, as we get some warmer days in December, that the variation, we're getting quite a wide span of uh, 
something like 13 degrees now, 12, 13 degrees, when earlier on it could be 10 or 11. Uh, can we pick out another one, please? Um, September? And not such a very, both are slightly increasing. So I'd say there's very little variation there. Now, I think you have another question for me. Well, I think that's all my later, my own data. It's just <coughs> absolutely <coughs> This fact I was uh, amazed by. We apparently in Britain have been collecting weather records since 1659. I mean, that's kind of 1666, a great far a long time. And we, some people like Eric must have been dutifully doing that every year. But how does this long term data, is this actually reflected across the country? Um, your, what we're experiencing here, is it a, a sort of a, a country wide <coughs> thing? Well, the, uh, <coughs> often the statistics are called as the Central England temperature. Now, this is a, a homologation of um, a whole lot of data from a roughly tri triangular area between Lancashire, London, and Bristol. Now, we're okay. obviously almost on the baseline of that, yeah. but obviously includes stations that are more in the Midlands. Mm. And they say that uh, we probably heard that. Last year was the fifth warmest in the Met Office record, and the trend is repeated globally. Uh, we're discussing the increase about one, one degree or a little bit above. And uh, out of this data, nine of the ten warmest years for the UK have occurred since 2002, and the top ten have all occurred since 1990. Well, that seems to be a correlation with what I'm finding locally over the last 30 years and what they've had in this extended range. And it is so important that don't make snap observations on just a limited time, but to have a, the longer the period, you, the better idea of what's happening because there are cycles, as we know, in the, in the weather. Mm. And you get the El Nino and the El Nina, which also fluctuates in, from time to time. So was it <coughs> that we've had such long periods of data that we could see these patterns and begin to recognise climate change <coughs> quite early on? Is that, you know... Sort of valuable evidence, do you think, that Britain understood about climate change? We were one of the leaders. Well, it's obviously been documented, but it hasn't hit the public or been publicised except for the last few years. And it suddenly jumped up as if it's, it's something new. But those who were dealing with it, they'll obviously see the trend, what was happening over a much longer Eric, period. This the person who said, Excuse me, Gina, I can't stop as he beetled along St. Martin's because the temperature was going to get to 33 that day, was it? For the well, first time yeah. ever. I mean, <coughs> and I, that was about that 10 years ago, was it? And, and since mm. then, it's quite, you mm. know, quite often we have those 30s. Yeah. 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 Whereas I, I do remember <coughs> thinking, gosh, this is, yes. this is serious. Yes. Yeah. 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 So as we're on the same lat latitude as, say, um, Canada and Russia, they are really, really getting extremes. Why are we not sort of getting quite that? Extreme? Well, of course, the British Isles is an island, as we all know. And so we don't get the extremes of temperature that uh, Central America or Russia does because our climate is modified by, by the sea. And so it's slightly warmer in the, sum in the winter and slightly cooler in the summer. And of course, we do get to the effect as we're likely to get to the end of this week when the wind moves into the north and it comes down from the Arctic, or conversely if it comes from the Azores. And so uh, we have interesting weather, which is difficult to predict, but uh, they're getting better at it. Yeah. And of course, it, you, you're talking about the records. I was interested to see that we often get on our television screens about hurricanes in the Atlantic and very rarely about the Pacific. And they've had a very dreadful season in the Pacific, and they think it's gonna, the intensity and frequency is gonna be greatest on record. With the latest one, Hurricane Wilma about to hit Mexico. And as you probably know, they, they give letters to all the storm names, and they've got a W for Wilma, Willa, and they're wondering if they might run out of X, Y, and Z, they have to start with the Greek alphabet, because there's another month and a bit before this hurricane season finishes. So, I know you're a great gardener, but both gardeners and farmers, are we really looking at significant changes in, in both harvest times and things, which 
is happening very much this year, but also in what we'll be able to grow in this country, or is it going to affect places like Russia and Canada more, do you think? Yeah, I think it will affect them more because we just, in, in, in a moderate climate here, but it does affect us when we get these very hot spells as we've had this summer and you struggle to have anything to grow. And we're fortunate we don't get these, I suppose there's some localised downpours, but not the huge quantities of rain we've had in some countries that have been catastrophic. So I think we're quite fortunate where we live there. Um, in terms of the climate, you were asking that uh, the variation, I was thinking only today have I removed my begonias. I mean, uh, two or three, 20, 30 years ago, they would have been long out of the planters because they've been dead. And so we're seeing something there. And of course, with spring coming earlier, we could, the, the ground is warming up a little quicker. So very small increments, mm. but when you look over perhaps 30, 40 years, you can, you can see the change. Mm. Yeah. So do you personally think, have, have any comments about how we should tackle climate change? I mean, from the weather point of view, you've collected the data. Mm. If you um, could foresee the next, well, it is 12 years, do you think we can take those temperatures down rainfall, you know, get things back to the pre-90s level? That's a very difficult question. Um, we all hope that the more publicity this sort of data um, mm. uh, and it, it is made available to the public, there'll be a greater awareness and a greater pressure on pressure mm. to, to do something, whatever it is the answer. Okay, that's what this meeting's become. Yeah. That was really, really interesting. I should I should have put at the beginning. I have no training meteorology. It's just a hobby. Yes, <laughs> as his wife will attest to. <laughs>
Uh, and most of them were saying you should do that because the experts say so. And I don't think that's good enough. I think we can do better than that. If we can actually show everybody why it needs to be done in a way that they can get their heads around, then action is more likely to, to happen. So that's what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to show you that actually you can calculate these things surprisingly accurately using a really ludicrously simple calculation. So this is all the science I'm going to teach you, and I'm guessing everybody here knows it already, so there's nothing new to, to, to learn from that. Essentially, there are two things to worry about. Um, the more stuff we set fire to, the more carbon dioxide we put in the air. And the more carbon dioxide we put in the air, the higher the temperature gets. And that's really, really simple. All I'm going to do is, is just put a few numbers on that, those ideas. So if you're happy with those ideas, everything should go quite smoothly. Let's start with the first one. So fossil fuel burning increases carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, obviously, it has to. It's got to go somewhere. But it's possible that the amounts that we're putting into the air are trivial. And maybe the amounts that we're putting in there are so small that they're completely swamped by, by natural processes. Is the carbon dioxide going up because we're, we're to blame or not? That's the first thing I want to, uh, to look at. So I'm going to start by looking at what is happening to the atmosphere. This is data from this observatory in, in Hawaii. It's been collecting the data for 60 years, so back to 1958. What it shows is that carbon dioxide in the air has gone from about 0.03% to about 0.04%. Right, so that's it's gone up by more than, you know, by a factor of about half, half as much again as, as there was. It's quite a substantial increase. Um, so that's, that's what's happened. Can we explain that on the basis of how much stuff we've put into the atmosphere? Well, this is the data concerning how much stuff we've produced. This is quite literally a graph showing how much stuff we've set forward to, starting in 1750. So through to sort of 1950 or so, most of that is coal. And then from 1950 onwards, it's mostly oil. Uh, but it's just economic data based on how many coal mines there were and how many oil rigs and, uh, and so on. Now to compare that to the other graph, the one of what's happened to the atmosphere, what I need to do is I need to start in 1958 and I need to work out the total amount that's gone in. So for example in 1960 the total amount was 1958's contributions plus 1959's contributions. That makes how much this should have gone into the atmosphere by 1960, and so on for all the other years. So if you add everything up, you get this. So starting in 1958, okay, since the, the, the difference is obviously zero from 1958, what we're seeing is how much we'd added by 1970, and then how much we'd added in through time until by now we've added about 1200 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the air. So that's, that's what we put there. The question is, does that explain uh, what's happened to the atmosphere itself? All I'm going to do is I'm just going to overlay on that the previous graph, the graph of carbon dioxide concentrations from Hawaii, on top of this, which is how much stuff we set fire to. Okay, it's a beautiful correlation. Now, that to me is really overwhelming evidence that the carbon dioxide has gone up because we put it. Right. It's not the only evidence, there's lots of other evidence too, but that to me is immediately very, very convincing. So it's, it's definitely our mess, is the message from that. Uh, the second part of the puzzle is, okay, so we've got this carbon dioxide, is it going to warm things up? The science says yes it will, does that work? Well again, we can just compare the data and see, see what happens. So this is the temperature since 1980, this is quite literally the results of several thousand ERICs of there we go. Right, so all over the world, people have been collecting data for many, many uh, years. Uh, from about 1880, there's enough of it for it to be reliable. The problem prior to that is it's very, very patchy all over the world. But from about 1880, it's fairly reliable. Uh, this is actually showing the change in temperature since 1880. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that for the last 50 years, it's always been hotter than 1880. 
1965 was the last year that was cooler than 1880. And there's clearly an upwards trend on there. Uh, hard to discern to start with. We've got natural background fluctuations. Uh, this is an El Nino event. Eric was just talking about those uh, just now. Uh, and then, uh, you know, from 1950s onwards, there's a very, very clear upwards trend. But is that due to carbon dioxide or is it, you know, sunspots or something? Some people try to describe. Well, I'm just going to do the same trick again. I'm going to overlay the carbon dioxide data and see if the trends match. So I'm starting in 1958 because that's when my carbon dioxide data starts. So in red, we're seeing the change in carbon dioxide since 1958. Obviously, in 1958, it's zero. Uh, then 1965, it's gone up a bit. That's the carbon dioxide increase. By 1965. The bar there is showing the temperatures on this, this axis. And it's a bar because there's a range of temperatures. Like the 1960s haven't got a single temperature, it's fluctuating. So it's, it's showing the range of temperatures effectively through the 1960s. There's the 1970s. I'm going to track on quickly 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and the current decade. Again, there's a beautiful correlation between how much carbon dioxide was in the air, which is the red, and temperatures, or temperature increases, which is the, uh, uh, the blue. So again, looks like the, the science is right. It's being backed up by, by, the, uh, by the data. So that brings me to the back of an envelope. I'm going to cheat to start with, I'm going to take a shortcut. This is what I've just said then, that set fire to stuff, put CO2 in the air, get higher temperatures. We can cut out the middle man and just say, in effect, the more stuff we set fire to, the higher the temperature gets. I can show that that works just by plotting the data again. So in red here, this is the amount of carbon dioxide we've produced now. It's not the amount in the air, it's the amount stuff we set fire to through time from 1880. In blue we've got the temperature changes. There's a lot of fluctuation around the line to start with that because there is natural fluctuation in the climate as you'd expect. Uh, the 1940s are interesting. There was a very um, significant El Nino event then which made the world as a whole warmer than usual. It actually made Europe colder than usual and it changed the course of the Second World War. It's the reason the Germans didn't get through in Russia, because of that winter. But that, that's the nature of El Nino, is they change the weather in different ways in different parts of the planet. But since then, again, there's just a very, very clear relationship between how much stuff we've burned and what's happened to global temperatures. But I should admit there are possible alternatives. What I'm basically saying is there's a correlation, there's a very clear link between fossil fuel burning and temperature. Now, climate change skeptics are very fond of saying correlation is not causation. And that's true. Whenever you see a correlation like that, there are other ways to interpret it. And one obvious way to interpret it is perhaps you've got the link the long way around. Perhaps that's the link. It doesn't work, does it? <laughs> For that to work, you'd have to have coal miners, Victorian coal miners, saying to each other, it's a bit warm today, we've got to go and dig up some more coal. <laughs> there is no clear way for that to happen. There's a very clear way for that to happen. So, so I don't think that possibility uh, uh, really holds water. There's another possibility, and that's that it's just a coincidence. That we've just got two different curves, both of which are generally going up at the moment, and they just happen to match purely by coincidence. Well, I've done some, some very basic statistics on it, uh, and according to my calculations, the chances of getting a correlation that good are roughly one in a billion. Right? So I think that's definitely grasping at straws, yeah, to go for the coincidence explanation. By far the easiest way to explain that graph is that that's the link. The more stuff we burn, the hotter it gets. 
So I'm going to stick with that. And that's the data again. What I've done now is I've just pointed out that uh, if you look at the whole thing from 1880, temperatures have gone up about one degree centigrade. Uh, and we've produced about 1,500 gigatons of carbon dioxide in that time. So that's going to be my back of an envelope calculation. Basically, for every 1,500 gigatons of carbon dioxide we produce, the temperature will go up one degree centigrade. Really, really simple. Now, I think I can justify using that because the fact that these two curves follow each other means that that ratio has held throughout that time it isn't just true there it's true everywhere on the curve so it's definitely held in the past and the only assumption i'm really going to make is that it's going to continue to hold in the future as we start to put more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere now i'll show you a moment that, that, that looks like a good a good bet i'll show you why shortly so that's my back of the envelope calculation it really is a simple thing the temperature rise that you're going to get is the total amount of carbon dioxide you produce divided by 1500. That couldn't really be much simpler. It works remarkably well. So I'm going to use that then to uh, predict the future. It's not quite as dramatic as that. You probably recognize the film that's from. Um, so, how do we predict the future? Well, we need to look at scenarios, look at things that might happen in the future. So this is, this is my setting fire to stuff curve, starting in 1750, up to the present day. And the most obvious thing to do is just to assume what's called business as usual, which is that the world's economy is going to continue to grow, the world's going to continue to get richer, population is going to continue to go up. The result of that, we're going to use more and more oil, uh, and we're going to follow the same trend. Now, all you've got to do to turn that into a temperature is work out the total amount of carbon, carbon dioxide produced by 2100, which you basically just get by adding up all these numbers. Now, each of these numbers is how much in a year. If we add it up for all the years, we get the total. And that's what you get total carbon dioxide by 2100, nearly 7,000 billion tonnes. Uh, divide that by 1500, that was my back of the envelope calculation, and the prediction is a four and a half degree uh, temperature rise. Now, considering the simple mindedness of the way I've done that, it's extraordinary how accurate it is. This is what the clever people with the big computers got uh, 39 computer models predicting business as usual, that's the pink, through to 2100. And the temperature rises that they predicted were between three and a half degrees and six degrees, with the best guess being four and a half. Exactly what we get from that very simple minded approach. Essentially, what that does is that says that the extrapolation into the future of what's happened in the past is valid. So the computer models were needed. I'm not saying they're a waste of time, they really were uh, definitely needed, but they've basically told us. That the really simple linear extrapolation, linear approximation that I've used is, is reasonably valid and can therefore be, uh, uh, be used with some confidence. Right, oh yes, yeah. The next point I wanted to make though was that um, four degrees, four degrees ish, doesn't sound much. And some people have seriously argued that they quite like a four degree rise. <clears throat> That uh, it would just make England a much more pleasant place to live, a bit like South France. Right? Don't be fooled by such an argument, because four degrees is a massive change. That's why I got this slide, just to make the point. Four degrees is the difference between the middle of the last ice age and the end of the last ice age. It's the temperature rise that stopped the last ice age. That four degree rise eventually caused 120 metres of sea level rise. Okay, over a very long period of time, admittedly, but that's how much rise it got, it gave rise to eventually. It also wiped out mammoths and saber tooth tigers and lots and lots of other organisms. But four degrees is a big deal. It really is a serious change in temperature. But we don't have to do that. There are alternatives. Basically, we can set fire to less stuff. 
That's all we've got to do. It's that simple. So here's a possible future scenario, and it's actually a very plausible one. I think it's, it's, it's my best guess that actually what's likely to happen. Um, and what it's assuming is that we carry on increasing. So this is our setting fire to stuff curve up till now. We carry on increasing perhaps until 2030. And after 2030, we tail back off again. Now, the reason I say that's plausible is because this little panel here that I've made from somebody else. What that's about is that renewable energy is now so cheap that solar energy and wind energy is growing at 10 to 20 percent a year, whereas our energy needs are only growing at one or two percent. Now, eventually, the supply from the renewables will catch up with the increase in, um, in energy requirements. And these basic predictions of when that's going to happen are all around about 2030. So by 2030, we will be uh, generating extra energy from renewables faster than our requirement for more energy is going up. At that point, the need for uh, fossil fuels will start to drop. They will basically become no longer required. And everything I spent my career doing will come to a halt. <laughs> I think that's actually a very plausible future, and it's, it's the way we are going. Now, if we do that, again, I can just work out what's the total carbon dioxide that's produced. Well, it's just adding up all these numbers again. If I get a smaller answer, I get 3,000 billion tons. Divide that by 1,500, that gives a two degree increase by 2100. Now, that's much better. That's starting to sound quite, um, quite positive. But then that report came out two weeks ago. You've been hearing about that. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced a report looking at what happens if we go to two degrees rather than one and a half degrees. And the differences were quite significant. And so I don't think there's really much doubt that it would be much, much better if we kept temperatures below one and a half degrees rather than temperature rise below two. So what have we got to do to achieve that? Well, this does it. But on this scenario, I'm turning the corner in 2020, that's the year after next, and I'm pulling things down much more quickly. With that scenario, I get a temperature rise of 1.4 degrees centigrade. So that's theoretically doable, but it's very, very difficult. Very difficult indeed. So there's a big difference between two degrees and one and a half degrees in terms of how, how easy it is to, to achieve. Uh, the IPCC report actually comes to almost exactly the same conclusion, uh, but using the fancy computer model. So this is doing the job properly rather than using back of an envelope, but they come to the same conclusion. The blue curves here are the scenarios that keep temperature rise below one and a half degrees. The great ones are the ones that don't. And the key difference between them is the blue ones are peaking at about 2020, and the great ones are peaking later up into the 2030s. That brings me to the conclusions though. It's really simple. Um, Two degrees is doable. If we don't achieve that, we should be ashamed of ourselves. One and a half degrees is very, very difficult. If we do that, I think we can actually be proud of ourselves. And that really leads me on to um, the solution. The solution, yes, a way that we might actually be able to be proud of ourselves. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> so, system of climate lobby is a grassroots organisation which began in the US in 2007 and now has roots all over the world. We empower citizens to work with our democracy to speed up our response to climate change. And for that to work, we need hope. And a workable solution gives hope. I don't know who's listened to doom and gloom talk about climates and how bad things might be and that we I heard one on Saturday saying we might be extinct in 100 years that just makes me feel really depressed and want to go and hide under the duvet <laughs> what we need is a good solution we have focused our current efforts on lobbying for a carbon dividend 
So I should have a video. The climate is changing. Extreme weather is disrupting livelihoods and food supplies around the world. This is observed. This is documented. This is the scientific community's consensus. The climate is changing. Carbon emissions are driving that change. Emissions come from burning fossil fuels. So if we want to slow or even reverse the change, we must lower our fossil fuel use. By charging a fee on fossil fuels and returning that revenue to households as a dividend, we can do just that, starting a chain of positive effects. Fossil fuels become less desirable. Cleaner sources of energy become more competitive. The dividend creates millions of jobs. Carbon emissions go down, reduced air pollution saves tens of thousands of lives, and climate change is brought under control. We can make this happen, but enacting a carbon fee and dividend isn't in our hands, it's in theirs. How do we sway them? What can we do? We can use our voices to express political will and demand action. We must help our elected leaders work together. It's on us to tell them what we want as a group. Because when voices call out together, their impact multiplies. Government can respond to the will of the people, provided we tell the government what we want. And what we want is a livable world. This is what Citizens Climate Lobby works for to empower citizens to connect with and influence their members of Congress, to spread the idea that each one of us can address climate change. Bring your voice to citizensclimatelobby.org. So it's really simple. You tax carbon, you pay people. So carbon is taxed at source, so when it's imported or extracted, and um, that money, minus admin fee, is then divided up between UK citizens equally. Um, so that's full price for every adult, half price for every child. And I think, I don't know if Gina would say the same thing, and Judy as well. <laughs> when you go and tell people this, they all, eyes almost glaze over at the bit where you say tax carbon or put a fee on carbon. They think, oh, it's going to be light for duty at the fuel pumps. And you have to say and pay citizens a few times because it seems almost too good to be true. By the time you said this a couple of times or you've explained it, yes, you would get cash, you would get cash back. Um, people start listening then and they start to get excited. Great breakthrough to me was a fortnight ago when we went to um, the policy exchange in Westminster. They have just launched um, their research paper on this. Alistair Darling was there, Michael Howard were there, absolute polar opposite politically, and they were all saying, along with a few professors and people in economics, this is probably the best solution in the time frame that we have available. Now, if they're telling me that, and I think it makes sense, the whole thing begins to have credibility to me. So I felt very empowered by that. One of those, one of those people who were at that meeting said that you could bring down global greenhouse gas emissions by 30% in four years using this system. Uh, they said the system set up by Obama, this is in the US, but I said it in the US. They said under Obama's um, methods, 18%, Trump, 40%, come the dividend would deliver 30% emissions reduction. That's really powerful stuff. So, and you might think, well, I know he's never going to go for that. I know at least one person here. So, no, they're never going to go for that. Well, already one country in the world had one part of their country that had a company in dividend, and that was British Columbia and Canada. And we just got this literally at four o'clock today from CCL US. We did it in Canada, now it's time for the US. Dear Louisa, obviously it's dressing up to me personally, it's not at all no. <laughs> around Robin. Today, Canada has shown true environmental leadership. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced earlier that in order to ensure a healthy climate, Canada will adopt a national price on carbon pollution starting in January 2019. Specifically, Canada will implement 
a carbon fee and dividend with the re revenue from the fee returned directly to Canadians. For the last eight years, Citizens Climate Lobby Canada has been asking the government to adopt this policy. Today, we congratulate our Canadian CCR volunteers whose tireless work and enthusiasm has played a major role in today's announcement. This welcome news could not come at a more crucial time for our climate. As Canada shows the way, we know, not, we know it is no longer a matter of if, but when other countries will follow their lead. So we're really hoping today that's going to be a domino effect and we get it going. Because what this is going to do is this is going to make fossil fuels obsolete. It's not going to fight people, it's not changing people to tell their ways, it's just putting a pollution tax on carbon so that it properly reflects the devastation it's causing on the environment and makes green energy a viable alternative. It bring, brings green energy into the, into the equation. It means that people will invest in it. It means people will have the money because two thirds of the population will have more back than they pay out. It means that they'll have the money to pay for clean energy alternatives, mm -hmm. perhaps get solar panels or electric cars or any of those things. So it's really, really exciting to end on such a positive note. <laughs> and, and can we just add that yeah. actually at the policy exchange, uh, I sat next to the lady from BP on the other side was the man from the head of this forest and the treasury people were behind us. <laughs> Honestly, and they were just, and then there was me pretending to know what to do. Anyway, BP lady was just saying, yep, 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 yep. They didn't mind, they just want to know what is going to be implemented and that it's not a political football that will change at the next parliament. So we're almost pushing into an open door there. We just need the political will. And this Canadian thing, I think, could be a huge, huge boost. Okay, so the question was really about whether it's just about burning things and whether carbon dioxide is coming from other places too, such as agriculture uh, in particular. Something that's actually surprising to me is cement manufacturing. Uh, and that's included in those, those curves as well. And I, I read an article about 15 years ago saying that you can make concrete in a way where it absorbs carbon dioxide rather than giving it out. I don't know why we're not doing that. I've got, I've got answered that. Did you <laughs> find out? Because I didn't do that. Yes, because uh, yeah. I remember you saying that at the last uh, CCL meeting, and in fact, at that meeting at the policy exchange, um, one of the economic professors said, um, I was talking to CEO, one of the biggest cement manufacturers in the globe outside of China, and he said, we've known how to make zero carbon cement for years, but where's our incentive? So, no financial incentive to do it. It's also only applied to some industries, it's not applied to everything. That's, that's the beauty of the carbon tax, it applies to everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Point was just being made here, so I'm repeating it for the microphone. <coughs> that the current system is ETS and it doesn't cover everything, and we don't believe it's as effective as a company did. Okay, yeah. I, think, I think the beauty of it is that things that produce carbon dioxide will become more expensive, including meat. Uh, then you can choose you, you've got your extra money, are you going to spend that on? an extra burger, or you're going to spend it on having a fancier car. But you won't be able to do both. You can make your choices about how you're going to cut down. Everybody can do it in ways that, that suit them. And what, what I like about it is it doesn't force anyone to do anything. It's, uh, it gives people the ability to choose the best way that they can contribute. Should we have um, a question from the floor? You'd like some and questions, some questions from, from the weather sphere, would yes. you? Excellent. Uh, well, Susie, good evening, Susie, asks, and I guess this is directed at, at, at Dave, as a climate scientist, do you think the main problem is denial of the science or that generally people aren't prepared to do anything about it? I, I think the problem is, is a policy problem. It seems to me it needs governments. It's a big thing. It can't be tackled by a few activists becoming vegans. It's got to be tackled on a much, much bigger scale than that. And it has to be uh, 
from government action. That's the only way to get that, that scale of action happening. That's, that's my feeling. So, yes, it does include population because that. That increase that we've seen in the past and that was projecting into the future, part of that increase is due to increasing population and part of it is due to increasing wealth. So it, it includes uh, both. Uh, as for influencing um, developing nations, at the moment the West is still producing most. Uh, surprisingly, we're actually quite close to the global average per capita in terms of our um, output uh, in the UK. But that's mostly because we've exported our heavy industry to China. So it's cheaper to do it. Um, and that's where taxing imports comes in, because if you tax imports that are heavily polluting, uh, then that encourages the countries that are exporting to you to also cut back on the amount of pollution. So again, I think we just keep coming back to the, the same policy. I think this, uh, is a very simple way of, of tackling all the issues without needing lots of complicated regulations. Um, if I might jump in there as well, um, one of the people quoted from the UN's IPCC um, was somebody from the Chinese government. And he said that the Chinese are now going around the cities, going, this is terrible, the, the smog, mm -hmm. it's the, the air pollution by itself is dreadful. <clears throat> and they need to clean up, and they've, they're spending an awful lot of money into um, clean energy and trying to clean up their act. I think they've really cleaned up their policy on accepting, for instance, plastic to recycle. So they're not accepting a lot of our plastic unless we're much more stringent with how we sort it out. So um, it, it can, that's a big message that people sometimes put across, especially and people who are trying to deny or say we can't do anything about it. It's what about the poor countries. And I think it's also awareness. I was at a talk last year and there was a lady from Tanzania sitting next to me. She'd just done a PhD in family planning. She was about to go back to the village and she listened to this talk on um, climate change and what we can do. And she said, I'm going to go back to my village and say, well, we don't need to go. Let's not do the national grid. Let's just get solar panels. And that was like a big kind of, if you like, light bulb, sunshine moment. So sometimes it's just letting people know what's out there, not saying, no, you can't have the benefits we have from you know, the Industrial Revolution. Or whatever. So far, the back of the envelope calculations show a direct relationship between CO2 and temperature rise. But do you think reaching certain temperatures will trigger feedback loops that will create bigger temperature rises? Can we look back in time to help us predict this? This is about so-called tipping points where I mean, the, the simple approximation of use is that everything happens really smoothly and easily uh, in a uniform way. Uh, and it may not be that simple. In fact, it almost certainly isn't that simple. There certainly are cases in Earth's history when there have been quite sudden, quite catastrophic shifts from one state to another. Uh, and we don't know where they happen. So it's quite possible that one, we could reach one between one and a half and two degrees, and that's it. Another good reason to stay at one and a half if we can, rather than two, because it reduces that risk. But yeah, where those tipping points are, they, they probably do exist, but nobody really knows exactly where they are. I think the, because they're using a large number of different computer models, they all assume slightly different things. I'm sure many of them do include those kinds of factors, but uh, there was no detail about the individual calculation methods in, in that report. It directed you to other publications, which I But there was a general assumption that those yeah. feedback effects that we hear about, the yes. scary ones, mm. are generally they're, built in. They're definitely, yeah, they're, they're built into most of the models, yes. Uh, and they're definitely there, they're definitely real feedbacks. Um, and that's why temperatures go up so fast, because of these feedbacks. Yeah, the, the, the direct heating effect from carbon dioxide is actually very small. It's amplified by these sorts of factors. I think this is why the, 
news from Canada was so important today because there was this feeling within CCL that once one country does it, we'll all start following. Partly because it makes it harder to do business with people who've already got a carbon tax in place. I think, that, I think that's part of it. And partly because we just want to see how it's going to pan out. Who's going to be the guinea pig here? And we've got guinea pig now. Um, so I think that once we see how well that goes, then other countries will follow. And I also think that um, I think climate change denial is rare now, especially in this country. I think um, very few are far between don't believe anymore. I think everybody's coming around to it. Well, it is possible. You deserve this thinking and pulling out. America already has. The Australians worry me. They're quite um, skeptical of that. So nothing is set in stone. It could go badly wrong. I think more reason for us to push hard in this country where, where we can influence our politicians. And I, mean, I have to say, we're very lucky in this country that all the main political parties support uh, policies but of this kind. There's what very little skepticism. She's supporting fracking. Yeah. This, is our, this is our MP. Yeah. She's supporting fracking now. What do we do about that? Now, this, that that's, this is the reasons for feeling fundamental. We've got to start getting grassroots levels. So, how do we make sure that she knows that we really don't like the way she is behaving? Um, there's two things. Um, the citizens' climate lobby way is to go in with gratitude. You don't go in and say, you don't like what you're doing, you're not doing a good enough job, you're not representing me. What you do go in, you go in and you say, thank you for what you're doing, thank you for representing us. So you start on a way that, that creates a, an equal partnership. So that's number one. Um, number two is with regards to fracking. Company and dividend will make fracking obsolete because shell gas will be taxed as well as former gas. So that's why I think it's better to concentrate on something that gets all of them than just picking off bits that we don't like concern really pushing our efforts into that. So um, funding dividend has been in place in, Japan, in British Columbia and Canada for six years. It's a very popular tax, people like it. They feel, great, I'm getting money and I'm tackling climate change, what's not to like? So they get a net, a net increase in revenue, but they may be paying more in, in carbon tax elements of what they buy. They get more back in dividend. So, ah, interesting question. So, um, the US has done studies that shows, uh, I think the Remy Report, big economic kind of researchers, have done such studies that show at least two thirds of the population will be better off because the one third of the population's carbon footprint is so much greater than the other two thirds that they, those two thirds will get back more than they pay in. So, the rich, basically, the rich third will get less. And the people of modest means and up to the rich third. Don't have capital. Does everybody get the same? Everybody gets the same. Right. But it's like <laughs> giving money back rather than taking money away with income taxes or something like that. Yes. Louisa, shall I do it? I'm not patronising, but coming up. I, I got, sorry. <laughs> with these two girls, this is. How I did it. So there's three of us, one, two, three. Okay. Not okay. So you I'm have not <laughs> you've had to pay four pounds, uh, sorry, you've had to pay three pounds to your new porch. Um, I'm four pounds, so, so I've only, or extra cash, or extra pounds. I've just put in one, you put in two. So in the pot, there are six extra pounds and whatever, we divide it equally between the three. If you get two, which you're happy with because you tend to do, you only exactly. get two, which is one less. I get two, but I only get one, so I am a lot better off. You're okay, you're less well. So, so it's it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's why it's a key inequality as well. Yeah, it's that, and the, it's at that point that these, you know, to say these two teenagers are.
point on mostly it's just quite simple. I'm not sure it's coming out of the ground. It's very easy to work out how many tons of carbon dioxide can get out of the barrel of wood. I can't remember the figure is, but you, know, you can find the figure on, on, on the web. Uh, so that's most of it. Uh, other activities like you know, agriculture and so on is a bit more complicated. I guess you know, probably a very good approximation that can be used. Uh, it would just be a question of you know, if doing this sort of farming, this many acres, you probably produce about this much carbon dioxide. That would be the way I do it. So I, I don't think that's particularly difficult. There are going to be some that are more complicated to work than others, and so you might find there's a problem out where it would be obvious ones like how much oil do you burn? And then agriculture is like the second wave, plastics the second wave. It's just a bit more complicated to see how many emissions that they can create. Well, is that, is that part of the dividend? The first act is just what we're, what's burned. Yeah, just what's burned, yeah. Because that is the biggest contributor. Yeah, we'll start with the biggest hitters first yeah. and then pick up off that everybody else. Well, a lot of the agricultural emissions are actually tied to oil anyway because it's agrochemicals that do it. So it's, it's still coming from the same side. It's quite complicated though, isn't it? Because they're using tractors which have to be produced. And then the production of a tractor would really produce a lot of carbon dioxide. Oh, but if you've already taxed the oil that was being used to make the tractor. So you're taxing the oil before it gets to the Yes, that's right. So the, the, the companies who on the import stream or extract fossil fuels, raw fossil fuels, they're the ones that are being taxed. So or carbon intensive industries that come in being taxed. Not the consumer, not so all the bits and pieces. Yes, all the costs then get passed on. So ultimately, everything goes up in price a little bit. But most people will get more money back in dividends than the extra costs well, that they Because yeah. it looks as if it's going to be more expensive. Everything's going to cost more. This is why I say you tell people, and they go, yeah, more, everything's going to go up. And then yeah. you keep saying, You'll get, you'll be better off, trust me, unless you're really, really rich and you have a massive farm footprint, you, you take airplanes, you have really expensive used cars, you're going to be better off. I'm going to be worse off, I've not checked. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs>